Good to be in the house of God. Let me just talk tonight briefly about one of my favorite books in the Bible. Just very briefly, I you know I don't. Uh, it's a uh, Genesis, the book of beginnings, and that is actually what that word means. Genesis means beginning. And why is that book so important, Brother Tim? That book is important because it is the foundation of the Bible. Everything, just about every doctrine that we preach, just about everything that we do has its roots in Genesis. This is why the book of Genesis comes under such intense attack. Because how you destroy something is to destroy its foundation. And once its foundation is gone, the structure will topple. It'll fall. Even unbelievable uh, structures that you look at and they say nothing could ever happen to that. What happened with the Twin Towers? The last, last report I read said that what happened is the jet fuel melted the steel structure that was tied to the foundation. And that's what caused the collapse of those buildings. So although they struck way far up, the attack went to the root. The foundation of those buildings brought them down. Even though you look at them and think, they're never going to fall. They fell because their, 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 uh, their link, their anchor to their foundation was severed. And it caused them to collapse. Look at, uh, look at just even in human history. The greatest... One of the greatest empires that the world's ever known, the Roman Empire. People looked at that and said, that'll never fall. The Roman Empire was built on a strong foundation of family and duty. But what happened as things went on and as they began to get an empire, and as they began to get rich and they began to get wealthy, they suddenly realized that they had more opportunities than just family and duty. And they became known for their decadence. And they became known for, for not serving their family or, or serving their family despite all else or, or, or spending money wildly or just doing things. And they got away from their foundation and their empire fell. Even though some folks might have looked at that and said, that's going to last forever. It didn't. And I think even Scripture supports this idea. Why do so many people have trouble believing in Jesus? Let me show you why. Give me a John chapter 5, beginning in verse 45. These are the words of Jesus. John 5, 45. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. Verse 46. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. 47, but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So the words of Jesus right there, what books did Moses write? He wrote Genesis through Deuteronomy. Jesus said, if you don't believe Moses, why would you believe me? Moses wrote about me. Again, Moses put that foundation in Genesis pointing to Jesus. He said, if you can't believe Moses, why would you believe me? Luke 16, verse 27. This is a parable that Jesus was teaching. Uh, Luke 16, 27. He's talking about the rich man. And the Bible says that the rich man, essentially, he went to... uh, He was in a gulf separated from Abraham's bosom. He was in torment. And this is what he said to Abraham in the parable that Jesus was was telling. He said, "Then said, Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father that you would send, send him to my father's house. He's talking about another man that had died roughly the same time. He said, send Lazarus back to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Hold on for the, the second. He's saying, look, I'm in pain. I'm in agony. Send, if, 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 you can't, if you can't go and you can't send me, send Lazarus back to my brothers. You know, make sure that they can, they can avoid what I'm going through. They, they can avoid this horrible place. Uh, verse 29. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. 
And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. (laughs) And Abraham responded, and he said, but he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Now, this is a parable that Jesus is teaching, but I find it interesting. He says, if you don't believe Moses, if you don't look to this Old Testament, if you don't believe in the Old Testament, if you don't believe in Genesis and the things that Moses wrote, even though one rises from the dead, you're still not going to believe. Now, in the parable, if he was talking about, you know, if I send somebody back from hell to tell everybody that maybe it'll change their minds. And he said, no, that's not going to happen. But I find it interesting that Jesus was teaching this and Jesus rose from the dead. But right there he said, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, even if somebody comes back from the dead, they still won't believe. So he rooted what he was saying in belief in Genesis and in belief in the Old Testament. He said, these are, these are foundational things these, this, Genesis wasn't written to pass the time. The Old Testament wasn't written to mark time until the New Testament. It had a purpose. It had, it had a goal. It had a plan. It was pointing to Jesus. It was demonstrating God's character and his ability and his strength. And Jesus himself said, if you don't believe those things, you ain't going to believe in me. Why does our culture have trouble believing in Jesus? because it has trouble believing in Genesis. That may be a little bit of an oversimplification, but I think there's a real strong root of truth to that. They struggle with Genesis, they struggle with the Old Testament, and so they can't, they, they struggle with Jesus because that's who the Old Testament is about. That's who it's pointing to. Oh, a lot happens there. <laughs> It was a very different world in Genesis. We do not grasp what the world looked like in Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 through 3. Because that world looked very different than our world. What do you mean by that, Brother Tim? Well, that was a world before sin. See, it's one of those foundational things. Why do we need Jesus if there's no sin? Where does sin come into the Bible? Genesis. So if you throw out Genesis, you throw out sin, you throw out the need for a Savior. You throw out the need for someone to come and save us from our sin. If there's no Genesis, then there is no sin. That world looked very different. Let me give you an example. Uh, Genesis 1.29. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. Also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Now, I'm not going to stake my uh, salvation on this, but I, I really believe that implies that When God made Adam and Eve, they were vegetarians. And it also implies, because it says all beasts of the field were given those things as well, that the animals had a vegetable diet as well. Uh, I I like to occasionally uh, surprise teenagers by telling them that there have been cases in uh, zoos of lions that won't eat meat. I have to go, and I didn't pull one up for tonight, but I have to go. If you if you want to talk to me later, I can find that article. But there's at least one or two. In fact, they actually they fed one of the lions. They fed him grain, and they felt that he had a need for meat or blood or protein, and so they put blood in the grain, and the lion refused to eat the grain if it had blood in it. They found out here recently, I was reading this article, that they had observed crocodiles eating fruit. And what they thought was happening is that the crocodile was basically snapping at movement and was just catching fruit at random. But at further study, they discovered that the crocodiles were actually 
ca- trying, doing their best to cause the fruit to fall in water. They would go out of their way to snap at the fruit. So what people had regarded as a strict carnivore turns out to have at least a little bit of a desire for vegetable matter as well. Uh, as a side, I just wanted to point out the world was different. Where are you going with that? After the flood, in Genesis chapter 9, when, God, when Noah comes out of the ark, uh, God speaks to him, and in verse 3, he says something a little different than in Genesis verse 1. In verse 3 of Gen- Genesis chapter 9, he says, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. So there's a difference there between Genesis 1 and Genesis 9. Genesis 1, he said, all the plants I give to you for food. Genesis 9, he says, every living thing that moves. He told them there not to eat the blood. Why were they not supposed to eat the blood? It's another foundational concept. He said, the life is in the blood. You know, later on in Leviticus chapter 17, he, re- he, he said it again. Moses said it again. Don't eat the blood because the life is in the blood. What does that have to do with anything, Brother Tim? What did, Jesus, what did God say would happen to Adam and Eve if they sinned in the Garden of Eden? They should surely die. Or in other words, a life would be required. You ever hear somebody talk about that? You, you, you've, your life is required? In other words, you're under a death sentence? What did God do? How many of you remember that story? What did he clothe Adam and Eve in? He clothed them in animal skins. In other words, when Adam and Eve sinned, They didn't die that moment. Now, they died spiritually, but they didn't physically die. But there was something else that died. There was something else that shed its blood. A life was required at that point. What was going on? God was setting into place, again, the foundation that something's going to die for your sins. Now, in the Garden of Eden, when he was clothing them with animals, it was the skins of animals. And he, he, he follows that further. And I, I'll even show you here. Uh, this, is, this is not me just, just talking. This is, this is a concept. This is a solid biblical concept. In Hebrews 9.22, Paul says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Well, why is that true? That's true because when there's sin, there needs to be death. Blood is life. So when there's sin, blood is required. Now, in the Old Testament, that was satisfied by them bringing sheep and lambs and goats and sacrificing them on an altar. God allowed that to push ahead their sin. But then he he goes on in Hebrews, he goes on to say, you know what? The blood of bulls and goats isn't good enough. So much foundation in Genesis one of my, uh, one of the things I find interesting, they sinned. God's pronouncing punishment. He's pronouncing curses. He curses three things. He curses the snake, he curses the woman, and he curses the ground for the sake of Adam. But the very first one, when he curses the snake, in that curse, he lays the foundation for what is coming later. I believe it's Genesis 3.15. I didn't give Seth a list of scriptures tonight if you're wondering what's going on. (laughs) And this is, again, this is God talking to Adam and Eve. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. I'm sorry, he's cursing the snake at this point. And between your seed and her seed. In other words, between the children of the serpent and the children of the woman. Although here... With the next sentence, it's referring to a specific person because it says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So what was he saying? While in the middle of pronouncing punishment, God says, 
I'm going to throw you some hope. See, right now, this snake got you involved in some bad stuff, but there's coming a day when his descendants and your descendant, and your descendant is going to bruise his head. And the, snake, the snake or the, uh, the powers of darkness are going to bruise his heel. He said, there's coming a day when there's going to be victory. So even in the middle of punishment, God lays a foundation. Now, who is he talking about here? Do we know of anybody that's bruised the head of Satan, crushed his head, brought his kingdom down? Jesus, when he came, when he sacrificed his life, when he rose from the dead, he took the power of death, hell, and the grave. He walked into the devil's kingdoms and he said, I want the keys give them to me and I would say very thoroughly yeah did he did he did he literally brush uh, excuse me did he literally bruise the head of Satan he, he crushed his power he took his he took his one weapon fear of death he said you're gonna give that to me I'm not gonna have to be afraid of death anymore <laughs> and what did Satan's one most powerful weapon the fear of death do to Jesus he blew the doors off his own grave I think you could say that that was a little bit like bruising his heel. He just, he said, do your best. You ain't going to hold me down. I, liked, I, heard, I heard one preacher put it this way, and I, I've, always, I've always liked it. He said, he said that the reason that Jesus' heel was bruised is because he was using it to crush the head of the serpent. <laughs> in fact, there's a, scripture in, there's a scripture in Galatians that said, if they had known, what would happen when they crucified Jesus if the rulers of darkness had known they wouldn't have done it? What are you saying, Brother Tom? I'm saying that in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, in that verse, God laid the foundation for the Jesus that was coming later. He laid the foundation. He told them, keep your eyes open because there's coming a day when this person who, who deceived you, when this person who... who uh, misdirected you and has abused you, his power's coming to an end. And he got him looking forward to that. Oh, goodness. Foundational. Again, why did Jesus come? To save us from our sin. But if Genesis isn't true, then sin's not really a real thing. Why do you think so many people are leaving or refusing to believe? I'm going to live the way I want to live. Or uh, what's right for you, what's true for you is not true for me. You know, or all truth is relative. What works for you doesn't work for me. A lot of it goes back to they're unwilling to believe what Moses wrote. Some cases, it's because they haven't been taught. In fact, a lot of cases nowadays, a lot of cases nowadays, it's that they've not been taught. But there's quite a few, too, that they've heard it and they've dismissed it. And if you can't believe Genesis, why would you believe Jesus? I would encourage you to read the book of Genesis, find out what other things are foundational, you have the first marriage. You have the first time of human government. Oh, goodness. You have the first agreement, the first covenant, the first testament between God and man that's still in effect today. All that stuff has its roots in Genesis. It starts there. Find out. Search it. Read it. Ask questions find out. Get your foundation strong. Get your foundation ironclad and nothing will shake you. <laughs> trying to think if there's anything else I'd like to say. I think that's it. I think I just want to leave you with the fact that if you're looking for if you're looking for evidence of Jesus, start in the book of Genesis. He's there. Oh, he's there. You know, Abraham 
was going to sacrifice before God. God tested him, said, sacrifice your son. And then at the last moment, he said, you don't, you don't have to. Now, now, now I know that you're faithful. And Abraham, at one point, he said, now God will provide himself a lamb. And that scripture speaks to me. It had a truth at that moment, because they looked up and they saw a ram in a thicket. But it had a truth that was carried through in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where God provided himself a perfect lamb. He said right then, I don't even know if Abraham understood what he was saying. But he said, the bulls and goats, they're not enough, but there's coming a day when God will provide a perfect sacrifice. Where's the lamb? The lamb is Jesus, the one who came. He provided himself a sacrifice. When we couldn't cut it, when we didn't suffice, when we couldn't make it, when we couldn't do what was necessary, God stepped in and said, I'll take care of it. That was his plan from the beginning. He knew we couldn't. So he had set in motion a plan from the beginning to step on the scene. It's all there. It's all there. So read the book of Genesis. All right, don't you stand with me tonight? all right if we pray. Is that okay? Can we bow our heads here tonight? Lord Jesus, help us to study your word. Help us to get into it. Help us to see the truths that you have you've put in it. Lord God, help them to be apparent to our eyes, to see the wisdom that you have placed in your word, and to understand the, the connections, to understand the, the, uh, the implications, Lord God, to, to see the things that you have placed there that show that what we are believing is what you have said and what you have put in place. We want to give you all the glory and praise. We want to give you all the honor. In Jesus' name.